This is Lewis Art for Boxing Social in association with Empire Fight Store and William Hill. Delighted to always be joined with Dan Hardy. I always call him sort of the encyclopedia of combat, combat sports. But how is everything, mate? How have you been? Yeah, really good, mate. Really good. Excited for everything that's coming up. It's going to be a busy summer. 100%. Well, there's no better place to sort of start off the news than um, a big sign of the PFL Europe sort of just been announced. Um, I sort of first, uh, first heard of this guy when... Um, Seeing videos on social media, seeing videos on TikTok, on TikTok of him constantly flatlining people in the sort of regional circuit. But obviously, it's been announced today, Lewis McGrillan signing with a PFL, um, a massive, massive signing. And um, I'm sure something that you're very happy with. Yeah, I, I was super excited to have him join join the PFL f- uh, full time. I mean, he's, you know, where everybody saw in Newcastle, we, we, we heard and we'd seen, you know, the hardcore among us that do our research. We'd seen how exciting this guy was coming through. But then when he arrived in Newcastle, the confidence that he had all week, the swagger, the trash talking, you know, walking his opponent down and, and that, that crisp laser focus left hand that he's got. Um, he's a scary kid and, and he's just got everything that he needs to, to be a superstar in mixed martial arts. Um, you know, and, and now obviously with him being a part of PFL Europe, we can make sure that he's that he's fighting consistently and that, you know, his competition's improving and increasing as he goes up. But, you know, the, the sky's the limit for this kid. You know, we, we've got a bantamweight uh, um, um, bracket at the moment for PFL Europe and we'll be producing a winner in Dublin. But then you've got to think next year, that's that's going to be Lewis's McGrillan spot to go and take. Um, very, very exciting to, to have him a part of the roster for sure. 100%. And when you look at it, everyone's always talking about being able to market yourself. Um, him doing that outside of sort of a market machine like the PFL, where he already has a pedestal for himself when he comes in there, people already know how his name is. How important is that for a fighter where um, they've already got a name for themselves outside of just through social media and sort of building himself up and making a name for himself? You know, it's it's really valuable more than anything for for you when it comes to your purse negotiations because you know the more attention you can attract to yourself, the more tickets tickets and pay per view buys that you can sell, the the more of value you are to the sport and to the promotion. And that's kind of you know that that's MMA basics from from way back in the day. We learned that from the likes of Tito Ortiz and Ken Shamrock. Yeah. You know, and and there are some people that have just got a natural ability to do it. Like we see a lot of people trying. Some people try too hard and it just doesn't really yeah. stick. You know, like like you know, people create characters, the likes of Colby Covington, and you're like, ah, I just yeah. don't I, I don't buy it. I can't connect with it because it doesn't feel real. But Lewis McGrillan is hundred percent real. I mean, there's nothing unauthentic about him at all. That's who he is through and through. And and you know, people connect with that. It, it was the same with McGregor. Like, you know, when you saw him on the scales at 145 pounds looking wild-eyed and, and feral and then getting his opponent's faces. Like, that was real. It was real for him, which made it real for everybody else. And, you know, you watch the weigh-ins against Kulakan, you could see that intensity there with McGrillan. Yeah. And, and he's just starting off. I think when he realises that people like the character that he is and the fighter that he is, the intensity that he brings, I, I think he's going to be, you know, even more comfortable to be himself, like, like Conor McGregor was when he started to get the uh, attention. Definitely. And when you look at it now, you talked about a band and weight tournament. Obviously, another guy at 135 pounds is obviously someone like Dominic Woodin. Um, another question I was going to have, does it show how much MMA is developing where we're now seeing, you know, soon a lot of a lot of the times in MMA, especially sort of on the bigger circuits, like you guys like PFL, Bellator and the UFC, we never wanted to sort of match the English fighters against each other. And it was sort of that they'd avoid each other. But now we've obviously seen um, I think the one that I could obviously I'll, I'll think of most recently would have been Lerone Murphy and, and Nathaniel Wood. But now you could also look, I know Wooding's a little bit more experienced than McGrillan, but you can always look at them too and say like, it shows how much MMA has come in the UK where we're now getting big domestic matchups as well that are potentially in the pipeline. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, this is part of the reason why I think PFL Europe is so interesting is because like we just pick the best fighters to to put in the bracket, you know. Like like we we, we may have the the same flag represented twice in a bracket, but if they're the the most deserving fighters to be in that bracket, then you know I don't mind whether they're both from Ireland or both from England or both from Germany or you know like we've got two German flags in the same bracket for the bantam weights this year with you know with with Kakarod and and Farbad Nazad. I, I I feel like. I feel like like Lewis McGrillan is not far off the bantamweight bracket right now. I mean, I think he would look at the guys in this division and think to himself that, that he fancies his chances against every one of them. 
the only point of difference really is the is the level of experience of yeah. the likes of Franz Malambo and Don Woodin and you know I mean Ali Taleb's eight no you know he's he's not not that dissimilar to McGrillen. Um but then I, I think McGrillen, I mean he's a young man, isn't he? You know, he's still got to develop into himself and the punching power that he's got in his early twenties, he's only going to get more impressive as he grows. I, I just I don't want to I don't want to see him rush because I feel like he's still developing. I feel like he's a superstar and I feel like we're going to see that regardless of who he fights in the future. But, you know, we'll, we'll get him on this Berlin card. He's got a tough matchup, another another strong veteran, um, someone that's going to push him. And then, you know, we'll, after that, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see where he goes. Um, but I would imagine that next year he'll be right in the mix with the bantamweights. And if, you know, the likes of Don Wooden is around, I don't see any reason why that fight couldn't be made. Definitely. Going from sort of one potential superstar to another potential superstar, a guy that I've admired for so many years. And, you know, if you know in combat sports, you know this guy's name, you know how good he is. PFL announcing. And I think I, I saw this, when I saw this son, I was like, wow, this is incredible. But Cedric Dumbe signed to the PFL. Um, if you know about Glory, I'm sure you know, Dan, you know how good this guy is. And the superstar, the, the, the draw that he could potentially bring to the PFL of a different market, um, just an incredible sign in that oh, I was it gets me excited talking about it to be honest with you yeah yeah that, I mean that that one was I mean you know what an epic sign in especially for you know as a European fighter as well you know Cedric Dumbe what's his kickboxing record like 75 and 7 or something like that yeah and you, you look at the fights that he's had the performances that he's had he's, he's such a skillful striker crossed over to mixed martial arts he's won his first four fights a lot of body work in mixed martial arts really works well for him. Punches to the body, knees to the body. Um, I, I, he's going to be an interesting addition no matter where he goes. But, you know, within the PFL, he'll be able to stay busy. I'm hoping that at some point we can get him back over to Europe to be, uh, to be you know, a, a feature bout on one of our cards, especially in, in France. You can imagine the, uh, the the intensity of a crowd in Paris that showed to uh, to a Dumbay fight. Um I'm excited. I mean, you know, it, it's very rare that you get someone that's got such a crisp high level, uh, you know, of striking or grappling even that crosses over into mixed martial arts and he's able to have the same kind of impact. I mean, he's he's in amongst the welterweights over in on the global roster at the moment. And, you know, you, you look like he's matched up against Al Salawi for, for uh, June. I'm going to be cage side for that. I can't wait. And, yes. and I think that he's going to be very competitive against every one of them. Um, but yeah. What what a what a superstar and uh, what an awesome signing. Hundred percent. I think you talked about sort of the French MMA there, the rise of it. Obviously, we saw Garn versus um, Garn v two versus, and we saw the incredible atmosphere there. And we've seen Bellator go there previously. Um, just shows that how special that this really could be, to be honest. Um, but yeah, sort of wanted to talk about. Obviously, there's there's some massive news last week. Um, you already, probably already know what I'm going to say. Um, Francis and Garnu. Um, um, unbelievable signing for the PFL. It's sort of hard for me to even sort of stay, put it in words, but to get this on and over the line for the PFL, not only on a fighting standpoint, but but Ngannou as a person, as a hum, like sort of a, as a, on a humanitarian standpoint, um, for the brand of PFL, it must be so special to have the poster boy of someone like Ngannou who represents so much more than just MMA. Yeah, it, I mean, it, you know, I, I was hoping as soon as he started testing free agency that it, that he'd find a home with the PFL because. You know, I know that the PFL have got big plans worldwide. There's a, you know, a lot of, um, you know, creativity with the way that PFL approach the sport and mixed martial arts. And, and you know, you know what the what ingarnu has got in mind with with uh, you know what he wants to do for mixed martial arts in Africa, what he wants to represent for fighter pay and for you know for fairness. I, I I feel like I mean he's not even it's not even like PFL have signed with him. It's more like we've partnered with him. It feels yeah. you know he's such a He's such a huge presence in his own right. Same as Jake Paul, really. You know, like he's such a, a big presence. He's got such big plans for what he wants to do with himself as well as, you know, what he what he can do for the sport from the outside. Um, I, I just feel like, you know, I just feel like PFL's his jetpack to get to where he needs to be, basically. And, you know, you put $2 million on the table for an opponent mm -hmm. and those 10 and 0 heavyweights that are looking where they're going to sign to, to, you know, to you know, really get their teeth into their career. Do they go to the UFC and and get twenty and twenty? Do or do they take a chance and and step in there against Ngannou? We, we've got a good heavyweight division already in the PFL, and and I think having Ngannou there as the special feature bout where people can make some real money, um, it is amazing. And he's also got the freedom to do what he wants as well with boxing. Yeah. 
we'll go on to boxing in a minute, but I did sort of want to talk about you mentioning there about the two million from the opponent. And is there a concern with the public where people may say that with him not being at the UFC anymore, um, is there a worry about who he may fight? You know, people talking about Fabrizio Verdum, guys like that. Is there a worry where people may say, oh, well, the quality ain't as good in the UFC compared to the PFL, um, where Ngannou's going somewhere where, you know, um, the, the quality won't be as good and it won't be as competitive fights. Is there a worry about that for you? I mean, you know, it's, it's a good point to make, but I think, you know, what what we have to bear in mind a few things. First of all, there's, there's a period of time between Ngannou, um, you know, stepping back into competition and now. So there's going to be time for the heavyweight division to shift quite a bit. And we know it, it can shift quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Like John Jones may have one fight left yeah. and, and then he's done. Stipe Miacic is, you know, almost as old as me. Like he, he's yeah. probably he's probably thinking about hanging him up soon as well. Like who else do you want to see Ngannou fight in the UFC heavyweight division? I mean, you know, Sergei Pavlovich, maybe Tom Aspinall at some point, but we're getting thin on the ground already and we're in the UFC's heavyweight division. Like what what we what you're thinking is with two million on the table, there are fighters that are future stars of the UFC heavyweight division that might not make it onto the UFC roster because there's a good purse elsewhere. Like the likes of Tom Aspinall, you know, and, and of course, you know, there are heavyweights across the world. I, I've been doing research because I might do a heavyweight um division next year for Europe yeah. because we have some some fierce competition in Europe for heavyweights, you know, through France and Germany and Poland. Like we've got a couple of really strong heavyweights in the UK as well, with with Abraham Babley and Louis Sutherland from from Scotland. It's like th- this competition out there. You need to let it develop, and the money's on the table, which means the competition will develop. I, I think we have to be realistic. Like there aren't many heavyweights out there generally that you'd want to see in Garnu fight. This is why some of the boxing matches are so interesting. But in the heavyweight division, the UFC, I would say. Maybe two fights are interesting. I don't even think Ngannou against Stipe is interesting. I I would want to see him fight John Jones and then maybe Pavlovich, and then I'm kind of done. You know, it was only the reason I say this is because I don't know if you saw it, but sort of Dana White came out and said that the deal doesn't make no sense to me, and he said that Francis Ngannou doesn't want to take any risks. And he didn't want to take a risk against John Jones. That's the reason I sort of asked that question. But when you, I mean, that was me picking out a few. I mean, he went on sort of a 10 minute rant about the whole thing with, I'm, I'm sure you saw it, but I did. Yeah. Yeah. But you you know what I'm trying to say? That's what made me sort of ask the question was the, the comments from Dana White. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I was, I was talking to, uh, you know, to Sean O'Connell about this last night. Like imagine, imagine we branched off into a parallel universe and John Jones never comes back to the UFC. Francis Ngannou stays as the UFC heavyweight champ and Jones decides he wants to sign for the PFL and, and, you know, t- take his career in that direction. Do, do you think that we would hear John Jones, uh, you know, being cast in the same light as Francis Ngannou? Like, of course, well, John Jones didn't want to come back to the UFC because he's he's scared of fighting Francis Ngannou. John Jones didn't want to take any risks. That's why he's not with the UFC anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Like, the narrative is swayed to suit the UFC's perspective. And, that you know, that's why he had such a dig at Robin Black. Like, if you yeah, look at that yeah, video that it. Robin Black put out, it, w- it was facts. You know, like, like Robin's a smart dude. He's, he's been around mixed martial arts a long time. He, he sees it for what it is, you know. And, yeah. and he, you know, and he, and he picked on the way he looks. But Robin Black's a punk rocker. Like he'll, yeah. he'll, he'll tell you how it is. And, and yeah. Dana didn't like it. That's why he went on that long rant because he, he you know, w- w- when he starts to stumble over his words, you know, it's something's bothering him. It's how he's always been in interviews. Yeah. Cause I was going to say, w- there was so much that he said about, you know, even talking about the business, about the money and obviously the potential Bellator deal. When you see, see things like that, do you look at it as like, he, well, he obviously started off with saying, oh, this is an attack on the PFL, but kind of sort of tried to attack the PFL. When you see things like this, obviously you've had a history of Dana White. Do you feel like all it is is him just trying to antagonise um, sort of PFL and what you're trying to do? No, I, I mean, I mean, I think you know he's 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 the main guy for the UFC. He's he's the voice of the UFC, so everything, of course, has to have a, a UFC spin on it. You know, it, it's Dana's always been this same person. That's why he's done such a good job for the UFC, establishing it where it is at the top of, of the sport. But but at the same time, like they've done a lot to kind of stop the growth of the sport from around the UFC, you know, buying out the likes of Elite XC and Strike Force and Pride and WEC, you know, as well as kind of having a, you know, a firm hold over a lot of other, what look like independent organizations that are actually not, yeah. you know, it's, 
it, it's like there's a there's a there's a monopolization going on that and it makes him uncomfortable if something outside of that out, outside of his control has the potential to create a lot of money that's why he always shuts down the boxing matches you know yeah. and and i was i was there ringside for mcgregor mayweather it was it was amazing you know what a it was a spectacle of, a, of an event but there's nothing wrong with that at all like mcgregor yeah. didn't lose anything as a mixed martial artist by stepping over because we know in a real fight you know mcgregor puts him away but it was a it was a great event and you know we, we missed anderson silver roy jones that was one i always wanted to watch yeah. you know there are a lot of times when things have been been shut down because there's not money to be made on the ufc's part and and that's it's it, it's a shame for combat sports in general it shows that you know it shows that he's not really a combat sports fan. He's he's the promoter of the UFC, and that's and he does a great job doing it. But we can't we can't have our perspectives skewed by you know the same repetition over and over again. You can't say Francis Ngannou is scared to do anything and t- don't want to take any risks. He, he went into a title defense with no contract on the other end, with no mm. knee. Like it, it's it, fact check it. You know it, mm. it's it's very kind of it's very kind of uh, political the way that he spins things. Definitely. And sort of just a last one for me. And I'm going to say this now, and it's funny that you sort of said this. And, I, and one thing Ngannou said, um, that he potentially wanted a warm-up boxing match. Do you? Well, so I was going to say, do you feel like that's a risk in itself where it could potentially devalue, say, if, if a, a warm-up fight doesn't go well? So because obviously you can look at something like Joe Joyce versus Gilles Zhang. Do you feel like a warm-up fight could be risky for Ngannou for a potential super fight where a risk where it might not pay off for a boxing fight with someone, you know, who's experienced in the ring. I mean, p- potentially, but, I, but I even think, you know, the, the, the perspective of what a warm up fight might be different for you and I compared to what it is for Nganu. I mean, he, he might be talking about a warm up fight. That's not Tyson Fury or Deontay Wilder. He might be talking about a warm up fight like Dillian White. Yeah. Like that was a name you mentioned when I spoke to him the other day, because of Dillian White's kickboxing background, he might have a good ability to transition. I honestly think he'll take a tough fight regardless because I think that's who Ngannou is, and I and I don't really think it will devalue him because he's a he's a very unique specimen in combat sports, and you could put him in there against anybody, and it wouldn't really matter at the result because there's always that potential that he's going to take someone's head off, like you know, like we've seen him do so many times in the past. And honestly, like there are certain boxes that I would pick out, like. I would I would feel very confident that Francis Ngannou would catch Anthony Joshua and put him on the canvas at some point. Even if he got outboxed over the distance, it would be dramatic while it lasted. And 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 I think that's what Ngannou brings to the table, boxing or mixed martial arts. Definitely. Well, Dan, do you want to say I appreciate you sort of taking the time to chat to me? It's always, I've been a fan of you for a long time, mate. So it's always uh, it's always appreciated to have the honour to sort of interview you. So I appreciate your opinions and I appreciate you speaking to me, mate. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Always a pleasure to talk to you anytime. Thank you. Bye. Bye.